Well, greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior. He is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. I'd like to begin by sharing a portion of Psalm 5. Psalm 5 has a bit of Psalm 23, you'll hear. Let me share this with you. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my sighing. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For to you I pray. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait, and wait in expectation. By your great mercy, I will come into your house. In reverence, I will bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make straight your path before me. Amen. Amen. As we worship the Lord together today in this house, I do pray that, I, that as you look at the silent prayer and as Michael plays the prelude, that your hearts would be touched and drawn closer to our Lord and Savior. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 The Word of God is full of living power. It is sharper than the sharpest dagger, cutting swift and deep into our innermost thoughts and desires, exposing us for what we are. He, he knows, knows everyone, everyone everywhere. everywhere. Everything, Everything about us is bare and wide open to all seeing eyes of our living God. God. Nothing, Nothing can be hidden from Him, to whom, to whom we must explain all that we have done. Let us bless the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. From him you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. But now, in Christ Jesus, we who were once far away from God have been brought near by the blood of Christ, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope through the gospel. One, one Lord, Lord, one faith, one, one baptism, one God, God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. We'll take a moment of silence for personal reflection and confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. O Lord, bend down your ear and hear when I cry for mercy, for I am poor and needy, and you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive. Your mercy is abundant to all those who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend the voice of my supplication. In the day of trouble I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Teach, Teach me to walk in your way, O Lord, to walk in truth throughout my day. I am genuinely sorry for my sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. Turn my heart towards you. Teach me to walk in the truth of your word. O Lord, you are a God full of compassion, and gracious and abundant in mercy and truth. Great is God's mercy to all that call, call upon him. There is a righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement for sin. And so all who believe are justified freely by his grace. As you believe, so be it. You're forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Please be seated for the reading of the lessons. Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, and we see the direct results of the fall. It says, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you, do, if, you not, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, 
Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from Acts chapter 18 and chapter 19. And we see Paul in Corinth, Ephesus, and the province of Asia. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see him, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. When Apollos was in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannius. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson is found in Luke chapter 18. It's a great parable. Uh, I think many Americans are having some of the same problems that uh, some of the Pharisees had as they went to the temple because we tend to lie rely on our own good works, earn God's forgiveness. And Jesus said, no, you must repent. Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, And those who humble themselves will be exalted. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hand on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. 
Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May be seated for the singing of the message hymn. in peace be multiplied unto you from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us share the text that's printed for us this morning. In Corinth, every Sabbath, Paul reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. In Ephesus, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. In Acts chapter 17, we are recorded by Luke the missionary journey of Paul and Silas. They arrived in Thessalonica, then Berea, and then finally on to Athens. Now we're going to be covering chapters 18 and 19 together, and we find that Paul and his missionary troop now includes not only Silas, but Aquila, Priscilla, Timothy, and Luke. Together they are proclaiming the gospel in Corinth and in Ephesus. In Athens, the big issue was the resurrection. They just couldn't believe it. Sometimes the big issue for people is not believing what the Bible says. Sometimes people argue about God the Creator or the Trinity or whether Jesus is really the only way of salvation. Sometimes people just don't believe in heaven or hell. Very often, unbelievers cannot accept that they're sinners and they desperately need God's grace. They don't like to be told, and sometimes I don't think we like to be told either, uh, that we're unable to save ourselves because we're Americans and everything is, you know, we could do it ourselves. And so we are told by the Scriptures that we must place all of our trust in Jesus for our salvation and quit relying on ourselves. When we come to Ephesus, we find that the big issue in Ephesus was money. People were becoming Christians and they, were, they weren't buying idols to Artemis anymore. And the idol makers got really upset and ended in a riot. This theological truth that Jesus is the God-sent Savior always caused problems for some and often resulted in persecution for Paul. This 
truth is why the church and the values of Jesus are under attack in America as well. You know, parents are being attacked all the time at school board meetings. What for? Values. Values. So my point is this. The gospel will never be universally popular, but we are commanded to tell the story of Jesus anyway. When Paul was in Athens, was his mission work there a failure? I think he left with five believers. He was there for quite a while. The point is, not everyone is going to accept the words of Jesus. So we should not expect everyone to cheer us on when we're sharing the story of Jesus. And as we remember from Athens, some people just laughed when they heard about the resurrection. This past week, I decided to plant ryegrass in my yard. I've kept it watered every day. And then I noticed that some of the feed fell on the concrete. And some fell where I didn't intend for it to fall. So now I'm waiting for the seeds to sprout. They told me it'd take about a week, week and a half. So they I'll have a green yard this fall and this winter. I also planted new vegetables in our garden. They looked pretty droopy. Well, I have to be patient. I thought about getting little sticks and going out there and setting them by each one of the plants so they'd really stick up. But then I realized that if I did that, I might destroy the new roots they're trying to establish a new home in a new place. I must be patient. Patience also applies when we are sharing Jesus. Not everyone can make an impulsive decision to follow Jesus. Sometimes people just need more time to work, work it out in their own minds. Remember, when you plant seeds in the ground, the harvest doesn't spring up the next day. You've got to water and weed and wait, and it's the same when we share the gospel. Patience. Patience is my dog watching me, waiting for me to reach down and pet him. I mean, his eyes just are there begging you, and he looks at you, and he looks at you. He'll wait there a long time until I finally reach down and pet him. That's patience. When we share Jesus with our de-churched, our God-believing friends, we need to be patient. We can't stomach waiting in line at a bank or at the food store or at the fast food place. We grow restless waiting in the doctor's office looking at all those magazines. We get frustrated the government's check is a little bit late. And we really get upset with that guy who's driving the speed limit right in front of us. Come on! Come on! He's driving the speed limit, but... My gosh. We need to be patient, and we don't have it. But God does. God is patient when the word is shared. The gospel is such a radical message, it runs counter to everything else people believe. If we've grown up in Christianity, we don't think it's so radical. But it is. Because it presumes a certain view of God, a certain view of humanity, a certain view of Jesus Christ. And it demands a total change of your behavior and complete faith in Jesus Christ. To become a Christian is not an easy step to take because it means rejecting the world's way of thinking. The world entices you to believe that there's no God or, or that if there is a God, it, it doesn't really matter that much. The world wants you to think that you're really okay just the way you are. Christianity says you aren't okay because you've broken some commandments and you're a sinner and you desperately need God's grace. But in order to experience God's grace, you must turn away from trusting in yourself and transfer your trust to Jesus. A few months ago, I shared the story of Mike Christian and his wife who lead a small congregation of called the Afghan American Church in the Bay Area. Mike says that he will take months to engage people over time, sometimes even years, uh, before they even feel comfortable talking or becoming a Christian. He said, for the most part, all he does is just share his testimony and answer their questions. 
That's patience. He writes, those who contact me are asking a lot of questions about Christianity and Islam. Questions like, why did you become a Christian? What's the reason you accepted Jesus? Why did you leave Islam? Why did you leave? Why did you become a follower of Jesus? Mike said, you can never argue a Muslim to faith. You just need to be willing to listen, learn, discuss, and know that at the end of the day, it is God who is the one who changes hearts. During the Afghan war, Mike was a translator, and he found himself in a very dark place and struggling after a very deadly mission. And that's when he had a series of dreams about Jesus who called him by name and asked him to share the gospel with his people. It's exactly what happened to Paul earlier in Acts. Paul was out, you know, pursuing uh, Christians and arresting them. And he had this vision and a dream. And God said, no, Paul, you're going to share the gospel, not only with Jews, but with Gentiles. And then what happened? Paul went through a number of uh, uh, imprisonments and got involved in this underground church called Followers of the Way. That's what happened to Mike in Afghanistan. He got involved in an underground church movement. He endured persecution, imprisonment, and torture until he was able to escape to America. And Paul and his missionary troop are experiencing the same things in Ephesus and wherever they are. When Paul leaves Athens, he goes to Corinth. Corinth was a commercial city on the center of sea lanes. had over 200,000 inhabitants during New Testament times. In Luke 18, Luke mentions that that is where Paul met a Jewish couple named Aquila and Priscilla who were tent makers. Because they were tent makers, they became acquainted with Paul. But they had been kicked out of Rome by Claudius in about 49 AD when Claudius made all the Jews leave uh, Rome. So I did some research on that. And it says the reason he kicked out the Jews is because there was too many arguments between Jews and those who were following this Christus guy, Jesus. Just go away. So after about a year and a half, year 52, Paul and Aquila and Priscilla traveled to Ephesus. Paul, as usual, went to the Jewish synagogue first, where he argued persuasively for three months. Eventually, some became obstinate and refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Ephesus had one of the seven wonders of the ancient world in its city. It had the temple of Artemis. Artemis was worshipped as a fertility goddess among the Greeks and the Romans, the principal deity. The temple was the tallest building uh, in the community, in the whole area of region. They had the largest library at the time, and it was a fabulous city. They had running water in all the homes and running sewage. When we were there, we were looking at the city streets, and there were little slots. And the, the guy said, oh yeah, it's big enough for a horse with a sled behind it to just take all the sewage from the top of the mountain all the way down to the lake. It was a fabulous city. But there was a problem that arrived because Paul was there and Christianity threatened the income of those who were making idols, which tells you how many became Christians. When Paul told the Athenians <clears throat> that the tomb of Jesus was empty, for he'd risen from the dead, they laughed. Only one fact is essential. Christ Jesus has come to seek and to save sinners, and he has risen from the dead after he was crucified on the cross. That's a simple message. In the 16th century, Oliver Cromwell ordered that an English soldier be shot for desertion. The execution was to take place the following day when the evening bell at the local church struck six o'clock. As the hour approached, everything was properly prepared. The condemned man had been delivered to the place of execution, had been blindfolded and bound. The firing squad was ready to go, stood at the ready, the appointed time came and went. It came and went because there was no sound from the church clock tower. So the captain says, go find out why the clock tower did not sound at 6 o'clock. 
A soldier returned with a young girl who had been pledged to married to the deserter. And she confessed that she had climbed into the bell tower and hung onto the, the clapper to prevent it from ringing. And proof of her story was given by her hands, uh, which were bruised and bloodied because she had silenced the bell with her hands. As for her fiancé, he was reprieved because the time for his execution had come and gone. <clears throat> it's a grand story of history. But for those who have been given the eyes of faith, it's more than a tale uh, from a place long ago. Because the soldier's story is our story. Like the condemned, we're all sinners because we've broken commandments and we're under the sentence of death for the broken commandments that we've committed. But God, motivated by undeserved love for us, acted to change our fate. Look at Jesus. Like the little girl, his hands were beaten and bloodied and bruised. Nails were put into them and into his feet, and he died to save us. And then his friends buried him in a borrowed tomb late on the eve of the Passover Sabbath. And days later, our Redeemer emerged from the borrowed tomb. His resurrected body was no longer limited by time, space, and physical barriers. And he wants his followers to simply tell the whole world of his grace and his eternal resurrection. And so Paul can write, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our bodies to be just like his glorious body. That's the story. And that's our story. We just need to continue to share it with our de-churched and God-believing friends. And it will call for patience. And remember the comment that Mike Christian made. It is God who changes the hearts. Amen. May God continue to grant each of us patience as we share his story with those who are seeking. Amen. We continue with our offertory hymn as printed in our order of worship. Please rise as we share together our confession of faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven 
and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty Father, we come to you, the gracious invitation of your Son. May we receive your gifts as little children, that no, re- that no rebuke of our sinful flesh, the world or devil, would deter us from turning to you in repentance. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, you do not delight in wickedness or let the boastful stand before you. Give the leaders of the nations wisdom to govern in accordance with your will. Keep them mindful of the stewardship that they hold on behalf of others, that they may fulfill their duties with diligence and humility. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, we praise you that you deliver our souls from death and our feet from falling. We pray, Lord, that you would care for those who are near death, those who are sick, those who are suffering. Preserve them from despair. Give them a confident hope in the resurrection promises of our Savior. And Lord, we pray that you would come to aid of everyone in our parish that need your help. We include especially Dolores, who is in the hospital. Father, be with her. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, grant that all who come to the altar, this holy altar today, would receive the very body and blood of Jesus in repentance and faith to their abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.